Steve Painter, welcome to Talking Pigeons. Thanks for us. Very good and uh, nice to have you here with us. I'm on it. Yeah. You uh, treasure of knowledge which we're going to try and uh, suck out of you now. Wow. And uh, yeah, let's get straight into it, Steve. Obviously, I know you way back when your dad had pigeons. Yes, yeah, that's um, where it started. That first started. So give us a little bit of history about that. Yeah, yeah I think we'll get up to the other points. Yeah. The Painter family's been involved with pigeons since 1958, and my, my uncle started. Okay. Formerly racing pigeons. Before yeah. that, on the farm, they um, they just had like commons and canter yeah, and stuff just like that. Have you always been on the west train? Yeah, my 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 folks, my uh, my dad and my uncle, they grew up in Machalisburg, right. and then in the sort of after the war, they moved to Krugersdorp and uh, on the plots, and yeah, that's where it basically started. And then my <coughs> my uncle had a business in furniture, and he did quite well. And um, yeah, you know, he was fortunate to be introduced. To the right people in, in the pigeon game early in his career. Right. So, um, yeah. yeah, he visited uh, Sonny Kippen just before he sailed in the, sure. in the late 50s, I think early 60s. That's a serious legendary name, eh? Yeah, and that's where he bought his first bird. And um, okay. yeah, he, he always told us the story with, you know, great enthusiasm mm. that he, you know, he was a good businessman and mm. he made a lot of money. Mm. And in that time, he imported a, a, a Merck from Germany. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, I think he had the first SL 280 uh, Cabriolet. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. And uh, that obviously cost him a lot of money, but his trip to Kippen cost him more. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so, he, so he Kippen wasn't sharp to charge. No, no. He, Charged a lot because he spent a lot. Yeah, right? yeah, he yeah. spent a fortune by yeah. all the, you know, the best patrons and all yeah, that yeah. And uh, so my uncle Wilkie was blessed that you know he got the best blood. And okay. um, you know when uh, I saw Kippen's book the first time, I think it was 2017, mm -hmm. um, at Leyland Bormans' house, mm -hmm. took some pictures where you know in Kippen's handwriting all the birds that went to to Wilkie. Oh, yes, right. and, yeah, oh, that's a treasure. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. And that's how, how did your dad fit in this, this so, whole thing? Then? So when my dad started uh, working as a Germany, um, his first congregation was in Huffington, and because he always had a, the love for the pigeons. Did he? Yes, yeah, ah, okay. uh, from childhood days. Ah, okay. And uh, so then Wilkie said, "Well, why don't you put up a little loft and I'll help you with the ah, okay. stuff?" And that's how it started. And yeah, when Wilkie basically retired from the sport in the early 70s, my dad just uh, then carried on, you know, with okay. the same family of birds. Okay, so, and, and so the basis of those, what we call, or everybody here calls them the painter factories. Yeah, the um, Kippen birds mostly. So okay. um, I would say up to sort of the end of the 60s, they're coming out and tell you so many no, fantastic so stories, stories, but. but I'm, I'm gonna draw some of the most interesting yeah. ones out. So let's start off with one of the very interesting ones is the painter hen in the Tom Lock family. Yeah, we are. So tell us a bit about her and how that all happened. And no, it was actually, it's ironic that yesterday on, on Facebook, mm -hmm. there was a guy that doesn't raise pigeons mm -hmm. that asked a question about Peter the Vet. And I mean, Peter the Vet. I saw that. I saw that this morning. But he is a bit of are, yeah. are very famous. Yeah. And, um, you know, you forget these things until somebody asks oh, a question. I saw that this morning. Now, Peter yeah. the Vet actually played such a pivotal role and I was thinking you know in pigeon sport mm -hmm. there's so many factors that make success eh? like puzzle, man. but uh, also fondly remember Marty van der Berg telling me one day you can do everything right you can have the best pigeons but if you don't have that little bit of luck it will be nowhere yeah. and what happened uh, with, with, with Peter was in the late 80s I think it was 1988 my dad, I left house, or was at the point of leaving house, yeah. and wanted to scale down. And he said, let's take what we think are the best top 10 cocks and top 10 hens. Because mm -hmm. he and Peter were, you know, they were very close friends. Ah, okay. And they had a lot of respect for each other, and they raced against each other for many years. And he said, let's take them to Peter, and let him rate them, and make a couple of ratings for us. And so, I vividly remember, you know, Peter with his mask, with the oxygen, he was very allergic uh, uh -huh. to pigeons at the, towards the end of his life. 
Um, but when he handled the hen called Sam, he said this is one of the very best he's ever had. Okay. And he said this is a golden pigeon. She'll, you know, she'll make big history. Yeah. And he mated the hen to the cock. No, for it, he made the mate. And the first baby mm -hmm. became the top hen. And what happened was, so how did, how did, how she did had it? Uh, and it, uh, my dad was. No, he, he really wanted to put a lot of toppies in the East End and <coughs> that's in the West End. Yeah. No, he was and in the East End. Okay, so, so what happened was, my dad rang, rang the baby with an expensive ring. And the first day that the baby got out, she was up in the air and gone. Just gone. Disappeared. Yeah, disappeared. So, obviously my dad was very upset. Yeah. And he actually, at that stage, then he said, if you know in the family did you get those birds that just they become too what he called list for flick. Yeah. They just become fly mad. Yeah. And he he'd often have his kid just disappear for hours, you know, and then mm. come back one, one, one anyway. So he said, No, he doesn't think that my thing's working. So he split them up. He made the cock to another hen and then to another cock. And the baby's gone. The baby's gone. And the whole season passed and I think it was early in the next year, just okay, somewhere season. before the next season. Yeah. The phone rang and Toppy traced the bird to my dad. He said, is this your bird? And my dad said, yes, that's why. Yes. That was my 50 year old ring. <laughs> yeah. And Toppy told him that the hen flew, flew well. And uh, my dad said, no, no, you know, keep it and uh, carry on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then about two years later, Toppy phoned him and said, the hen is breeding one after the other. Yeah. And, I, and as you know, yeah. you flew yeah. and as you know, Toppy made it to a cock, cock from Lubbies, you know, that uh, yes. you know, that pie cock mm. um, that basically also had a lot of kitten value because okay. it came from from more than perhaps all the no from uh, kilobits. And kilobits yeah, got so his bird, kilobits you know, got, yeah. kilobits got a lot of his birds from Absol and Absol yeah. also kitten. So yeah. anyway, um, he came back to my dad. And then said, please, you know, he wants more of that bay. And my dad didn't sell pigeons, you know, he said, Toppy, let's go and have a look what, what's available. He mm -hmm. said, no, he's looking for something in bread. And there were two little cocks out of, you know, the brother and sister of Sam. Okay. So the full brother, full sister, and they were tiny little things, ugly, ugly. And my dad said, these are the birds that will breed. And the, the reason why he knew that is he had a similar little cock that he gave to Monty. I think three years prior to that. And that bird bred Monty, I think two Fed winners and the Crado oh, no, okay. Championship when it all came out of the little what they sure. call the cock. And so Toppy then took one of those little blues and and then mated it to the Toppy head. And that's where the father of the head cock came from. Yeah, because that's yes, and that so if, if you look at the head cock's pedigree, I think seventy five percent of it is basically painted. Paint 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 yeah. yeah. And so if you come back to that trip to Peter mm. basically spawned thousands of winners and yeah, average as winners and one off winners, if you think about it. Crazy, yeah. Now, I think a lot of uh, credit must go to Alfred, you know, who basically, when Tom passed away, took it, took the family out. Took it to the next level. To the next level. Yeah, yeah, they did it, they did it. The other little thing, the other little story I want to get out of is um, the Sun City one. Yes. So, uh, was it the first South African? No, it was the second one. It was the second South African. I think the guy when I was filming it won it two years before. I think that was the second race. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to... And I think it, it was started in 97 and I think Josie had a bird. Josie won that one, yes, but it wasn't... It was, was universal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the year won. after that, a guy when I was filming it, if I remember correctly, okay. from the Cape won it. Okay, I didn't know that. And then my dad, there was a year that an American won it. That's right. And then the next year, my dad went up. Okay. Something and a little like bit that. about that bird? So and also, about the expectation and the build up to the Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's also, you know, my dad obviously, you know, a very religious man. Mm. And he, he always said, you know, the spirit leads him, you mm. know. And I think it's only phoning to enter a bird or to enter a team. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And um, so he said, no, he. He, he sees it, sees it as, a, as an opportunity and uh, he sent the three birds. Yeah. Um, 
the little cock was spread from his hand and my his his hand and my cock. Okay. Um, then the eventual winner, but he was absolutely useless on the tosses the and the hot spots leading up. And the hot spots useless. His his nest mate, which was called the Spencer, was really good with it. And I think she was third in the one hot spot and seventh in the other one. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, she was she was a shining yeah, star. She was good. And then I think two weeks before the the race, before the last hot spot, she got lost. Oh, sure. And then the other bird. Uh, the little head, I can't remember the day. She automatically took the place of that one. So Fairthorn was yeah. faithful until the week of the race. Um, Marilyn phoned my dad and so she was on the bird. Not, yeah. And we were in Cape Town, my friend and I, um, attending the Olympiad. Oh, was it the same year? Yeah, same year. Oh, okay. yeah. And uh, so I said, well, you know, let me see. Mm. It's a lot of money, but and it's, and it's a really bad one. And he said, but my dad said, no, he doesn't want to go to the race if that bird is not paid. You know, he just has a surface feeling. Yeah. So, so we, we ended up paying the bird, I think it was on the Wednesday or Thursday. And I was back from Cape Town, and on that day was my eldest son's first athletics meet. Uh, so we had no you know, plans to go to Sun City or whatever. And... My <laughs> folks came and watched this athletics meet, and it was in Hackney. Your folks as well? Yeah, yeah. so my, my, my family was there and my folks. My dad, not planning to go to San So no one was in San no. And when the athletics meet finished at about 12 o'clock, my dad said, let's go to San He's got a feeling. The spirits spoke to him. Uh, I still get goosebumps to, to this day. So we arrived there at about, I guess, 1 o'clock. I can't remember. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. But he said he just had this feeling that he's, you know, he's going to win this race. And I said, Dad, look, you know, That's there's, it's the best there's the ball, a thousand yeah. nine hundred yeah. other birds, you know. Not easy, yeah. And he said, no, <clears throat> he wants to go down to the lofts. Mm -hmm. And we walked, I think it was about two and a half, three k's to the yes, lofts. Yes, yes. We From sat, the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah. We sat in the road next to the loft, and that one was the the trainer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he saw us sitting there, and he said, come in. So I think. When he sat next to a German, I think it was either Karl Hans Wagner or mm. one of those one guys. Of those yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, it was about half an hour after that, you know, the birds came the two together. And as they came over the loft, they, they dove down, and as they turned, he said, they spent it. And Who I said, said Dad? I said, Dad, there's at least 500, 600 other checkers yeah. in this race. He said, no, that's it. But you only saw that bird when it was a bait. Yeah. We were having this discussion and the next one we came on just called it out. Sure. And it's still to this day. Yeah. You know, it was the best feeling ever. It's the best feeling ever. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, it's surreal. Yeah. I can't explain it to anybody. No, you can't. And yeah, you know, <clears throat> once again, luck played its role because that bird walked in first and, and the Hungarian's bird walked in second. Yeah, well, that's, 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 that's that's one of the criticisms about one loss, but there's nothing, absolutely nothing you can do you can about, about it. it. But to come back to what pigeon it was, so that same cock, Lothrote, yeah. that was the great grandfather to the egg cock, yes. was also the great grandfather to the ah, Okay. And to this day, his other great grandson was in, in our loft. I was going to ask you about that blood thing around yes. your, uh, no, no. your personal Absolutely, person. yeah. It does. So, yeah. What we call our miracle breed that we yeah. have is yeah. a great friend. So, too. so I visited a very good friend of mine yesterday, and you'll know him very well. Yes. Um, he's not very well, but he's healing now. He's rose about. Yes, I heard he was quite sick. Yes, though. but he's, he's healing well now. And, uh, so I told him I'm doing the interview with yes. you today. Yes. And he says, um, in his word, he says, he says one of the best fancies out on the rest of it. Huh? Well, and to that's a huge compliment. A huge compliment. Yeah. So um, I said to him, yeah, uh, I called him Uncle Lon. I said, yeah, yeah I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, and I'm going to ask him about a few birds because um, Joe comes here often. Yes. The pigeon whisperer. Yes. And he, Joe wrote about some of your birds that are, <laughs> you know, Joe, when he talks about a pigeon, yeah. you must handle this one. <laughs> you must go see this one. So in, in, your, in your loft, there are some superstars that Joe talks about. Yes. Uh, multiple winner birds. Yeah, it's basically it's based. The, the modern loft now is based on four birds. Okay, give us a So, so the first one is, is blue whip, which is a bait of battery. 
Yeah. Sorry, right. sorry to interrupt you there, Greg. What all, what's also important, according to what these guys say, which, which I think is very important, is, is yes, you do race well, you, you race very well there, but mm -hmm. the birds have raced well everywhere else. Yeah, we'll, we'll cover we'll that cover because that. So, uh, I'm just I'll come back to that because, yeah. yes, because it's, yeah, it's quite uncanny you know, yeah. that when I was driving here, I thought our birds have now in the last four years won in eight of the nine provinces, and the only province they haven't won in is in Pumalanga. And it's because we haven't had birds flying in in okay. But in all other eight provinces, we in the last year we've had multiple winners. We covered that later. But so who would is I say our, our premier breeder because he's also of the four the youngest. He's a 2016. The other three is the 70 Tom Winner hen that yes, yes. And so just, just crazy yes. about that. And we'll cover a little bit later on. And then Quinn and Cos, which um, was a product. Well, I've seen his name in a few pedigrees yeah. as, a, as a grandfather or yeah. great grandfather. Yeah, he's still, I mean, I, I yeah. raised him in 2012. Yeah, so I've seen him as a great grandfather. He was bred by, by Harold and us, we had him from DJT Lofts. So that's out yeah. of the past or so. Yeah, so the mother, Billy Kitchen, had imported it. Yeah. Um, and Harold bought it. And then a year or two later, we came across a Danish cock, also a pure cast bird. And we matched them together, and mm -hmm. the first baby was fighting on good and was just a, a yeah, superstar right from the beginning. Yeah. And then the, the fourth hen was uh, is the famous SK hen, which I think if you look at it purely from a statistical point of view, probably the best one. Because so that, why, why would you say that? Because she's bred winners, uh, 27 individual winners, with 14 different cars. So, so that's so, just so she's a good one. She, we yeah. haven't the first cock she hasn't bred a winner with was what? last year, but it was what also was because now we only raised was that the Fanta? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, the babies, um, you know, went to the one so we only yeah. raised one of them. So, we there is yeah. so, um, but yeah, you know, she's got a you know, fantastic story yeah. as well because I bought her just by pure luck, you know, I didn't want to buy it. Um, the, the late saddle pink and yes, we also did one at Sun City. Yes, <clears throat> he was the organizer of all the Sun City auctions in the Western Cape, mm. and there was a bird from Mark the Cock on an auction in Robertson that I wanted to buy very bad. Mm. You know, the sublines were sort of the flavor of the month in, in those yeah. days, yeah. and um, Mark had some of the best ones. And the bloodlines on that cock was very good, and he was a good performer as well, so everything was good. And I said to Minister of Finance, I'm going to buy this bird. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Come on, I'll yeah, go. so, you know, it was. Uh, I think the opening bid was around 17, and I was prepared to go to 25. Mm -hmm. That's a long time ago. That's a lot of money. The yeah. third bid, telephonic bid, was over 30 already. Somewhere from a seed bid, which I knew. Well, obviously, good enough. Yeah. And uh, Sam so said, but just hang on the line. I mean, there's another. Bird with some blonde blood in just, I think it was the next lot, you know, lot 33, mm -hmm. lot 34, I can't remember. And I said, Well, you know, have you had a look at it? And he said, You know, I could, yeah, he sort of hesitated. And he said, mm -hmm. Yes, he, would you like the bird on it? I said, So what's the opening bid? He said, No, the opening bid is there's no bid. It's 300 bucks. See, because it's after the yeah, famous, it's, famous Mark the Cock bird. So there was no internet bid on it because it came from Slovakia. And, um, so I said, well, let's bid on it. And I heard the auctioneer go 300, 300, 300 for the first, for the second, and I bought this bird for 300 bucks. And so I said, well, so many of them for some reason. Yeah. So I never handled it, I never checked it, bid it be nothing. The only thing that I did see was that she scored, I think, a fourth on one spot, four or five. So she showed. So she showed. He said, you know, it's here, you bought, I think, you bought the bargain, but she looks like a piece of well, the feathering must have been falling off. Yeah. Yeah. So she arrived uh, with us. And you thought, oh, what a mistake. Three or four days later, and she was, she was so ugly Shame. that I couldn't get over my heart to put it down. <laughs> <laughs> she had seven flights on the one wing, I think eight on the other wing. Body and, mind. and she was missing half a wing in the inside. So Henrico, my, my youngest son, said, no, give her a chance. And, but she was, and still is not the best handler. But she was in those days. She was just terrible in every aspect. So she's recovered. She will recover. So then she recovered in the 
next couple of months. Mm. And come August, when we start mating up, I found this bird that I don't know where, where she came from. The funny ring and everything. So mm. this was the bird you bought in Cape Town. But I still didn't think anything of it. So she landed up, we've got a little zinc loft in the front garden where we put up our feeder pairs. Feeder pair one, two, three, four. And she became feeder pair four's head. We never write down the numbers or anything. Oh, just this yeah. feeder pair one. So she was not so, up for breeding then? No, not at all. She <coughs> conformed to nothing of the things that we look for now. But even then, she was still yeah. nothing. You know? So, long story short, she, I think she raised three or four sets of other babies. And then she was out of sync and she hatched her own two babies. And there's nothing you do with those? No, I put them, the old ones on and I gave them to a beginner for free. A beginner that clocked with a hand clock. Came to the first race, you won first and second union in those two babies. First and second union? First and second union. And in six weeks, I think the one was a four time winner and the other one was a three time winner. It's crazy, crazy stuff. Whoa, whoa. So after the second win, I then went to look at the numbers to see who really did it work. Yeah. And I just saw three to pay four. And we rushed to the loft, and the hen was still there, sitting because it's a hen loft, mm. sitting in box four. To this day, I don't know which cock we mated it to. Yeah, because so, it's just been a feeder pair. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, then, you know, obviously we looked at different <laughs> <laughs> And then you obviously tried it with other... Yeah, so then, you know, because of babies, we were having quite a hard time on the short distances in those years, sort of 2014, 15, 16, we weren't great on the short distances. But her babies were... Oh, okay. For that cock. Strange, yeah, because that's... I don't know what cock you crossed with. So yeah, so, on this, so anyway, long story short, we then... F Ugh, there's so many things we can touch on, but... We then got on a theory about the throat, on, you know, to select on the throat. Mm -hmm. And this end, according to the theory, that so in, in so Rico, be, your, your, your theory on the throat is that the slit must be narrow and not... So it's just 50% of it. Okay. So it's more to do with where, for us, where the, the air hole, the, the yes, air yes, pipe, yes. in relation to the curtain, to the curtain yes. where it sits. Um, and we'll tackle that as a separate, that separate issue because yeah. that's an hour that's discussion. Really yeah. But she was perfect. Now we're going to have you back for a couple of And months. then, so we were fortunate to uh, Oliver Radford loan me a cock that Michelle de Becker um, bred, uh, an indigo cock. What, he, he was in South Africa? Or he, no, he was already in South Africa. Was in South Africa. Africa. The, the, that cock was bred from two imports directly from Jeff and Bunkle. Okay. And so Enrico made the pair. Okay. Based on the throat. And just know, quick just quickly, where does the throat theory how did it come about? It it's just not selection of birds. It, 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 it came from a friend of mine okay. um, who I sent the bird down before and he didn't like the bird because he said something about the throat. Right. But the head to me was fantastic. So I sent him another one which the throat was according to him better. Mm. And he turned into a fantastic Britain. Okay, and then a couple of years later, I came across the same gentleman and he was selecting birds. And I said to him, Please show me what you're looking for. Uh, okay. at. And I looked at what he was. Because you can always. And, right I, and I sort of made my own deductions from what he said and mm. made a bit of sense. And I went back and I told Enrico. And it's actually a pity that he's not here today, but. Well, yeah, Maybe the next time, yeah, because yeah, he can yeah. explain what, and, and he said, okay, let's try it. Because he's always, he wants to try new things. Yes, yes, yes. And he's low stats, so he wants okay. to down. So we then bred six babies, which I thought all of them were totally, you know, non starters. They were okay. terrible in the hand, you know, they were looking stupid to me and didn't handle well. And it was, there's nothing special about it except the throat. So when we basketed those birds the next season, they demolished the rest. And if, well, the story, I'll spend five minutes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, as you know, before the season starts in Gauteng, there's a big liberation at Princeton. Massive, yeah, all of us. 25, 30,000 mm -hmm. birds. And we always take our young birds there mm -hmm. and expose them to that. It's good experience. Yeah. 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 And we, as you know, the young birds struggle. You mm -hmm. usually get your old birds, old birds one, yeah. one, 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 yeah. maybe you're lucky to get two. Yeah. 
and then about 10 minutes after you start getting the young birds and, One at a time. and suddenly you sleep out. Yeah. So that year we obviously we passed with all of them and uh, Emika sits on the roof waiting for the birds to come. And the next month he shouts, you come hello. So I asked him, what do you mean they are coming? Yeah. He said, no, there's probably five or six. I said, I hope we get one. You know, and the next yeah. moment they come over the loft and they turn. And as they turn, in the six, there are five indigos and a checker. And that guy on the roof is smiling. Because now you can see that, you know, he, yeah. he's right. He's and at least I've got one checker my tree in there. Yeah. So I'm very happy. <laughs> and as they land, it turns out the checkers also have that pet. All oh, six okay. babies. They flew away from our next bird, which was an old bird, by six months. Sure. Amazing thing. Like, yeah. so, so do you base a lot of your breeding on that? So, on yes, that well, it's not, not the, yeah, this is like this, because if we talk about selection, mm. we select basically twice here. So the most important selection is still at the end of the season. On results? On results, okay. So with us, it's become stricter every year, and if you can do that consistently, and become stricter consistently, you you better. I mean, anybody can do that. You don't have to be a pigeon guru. Any no, beginner just. can do it. Can read the result and say, listen, cut off his if yeah. If you fly at the club level, maybe a fifth club to yeah. start with. You know, yeah. anything that's done in the first five we keep. Yeah. So now that's progressed now to a point where we're only keeping the first if they flew in the first ten in the union twice, at least. Then you keep then you keep the rest club. So, yeah. So has that resulted, <coughs> that, that system, has that resulted in more best birds or metal birds? Yes, for sure. No doubt. No doubt about it. But to come back to the second uh, time of selection mm -hmm. is when you wean the bait. Then you look at the throat. So that's when you yes. select. So if the throat's are a good thing, we eliminate them there and then. Okay. And we re-ring. You say okay. you're handing your ring and re Yeah, yeah. And it, Goes back to I've got a lot of respect for Oscar Rollins. You know, I read a lot of books. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> and, and, and what he says is so, you know, it's logical. Mm. So even if you're a top class fancier, if you breed ten babies, you're lucky to get one. Mm -hmm. And if I say a good one, I'm talking a bird that can win the union, yeah, find the, you know, find the top ten of the union yeah. often. Yeah, yeah. You're very fortunate if you get one out of ten. Yeah. So if you only breed forty babies. If that holds true, then you've only got four good ones. Yeah. But if you can breed 80, that becomes eight. Yeah. What do you do with the other 72 though? That's where this theory helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Because although, and <clears throat> Enrico usually says that to anybody that wants to listen, is it's not foolproof in terms of getting the best birds out. Mm -hmm. But it is pretty foolproof to getting the worst birds out. Yes. So, so if you yeah, can remove, I'm, I'm, I'm with that 100%. Yeah, if you can remove a lot of the worst ones yeah. right there, your the impact that has on your loft in terms of no, it's just its heating power. That's no, massive. So in the beginning, sure, when we started, what was it, 2016, 17, we got rid of 70 percent of the babies at yeah. weaning time. That much? Yes. And we so it took us ages to breed 60 or 70 babies to yeah. raise one. But as we got better and also understood the theory a little bit better and it evolved, <coughs> it's helped us how long. Yeah. So that now, you know, our hit rate, and that comes back to what you asked me previously, of how are your birds doing in other areas of the country. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so is there a bit of stats? Is that and the and the metal birds? So yeah. Touch yes. all of those now. So Obviously, one of the things we firmly believe in is first, never think you've got the best birds because that's the day you start going backwards. Yeah, Roland always says that. Eh? Roland says the same. So if you've had a sandbox gold medal, that's the day you start looking for the next sandbox era because if you don't, you will go backwards. Yeah. So what helps a lot is we make experiments all the time. So we get new birds in every year for the last five, six years. When you say new birds, is it one, two, five, ten, twenty? What are you getting? Are you talking stock birds, eh? Yeah. 
I would say on average about 15. 15, 15 stock plates per year. Right. This year it's been new. You've crossed them to the regional? Yes. So what we now do is, when we bring the new bird, obviously yes. its throat has to be right and okay. its performance has to be right. So, so, so it's also about your selection before yes. you bring it in. Yeah. So that's another thing that I think a lot of beginners and guys that are struggling do wrong. Is they read a pedigree, but they don't understand the pedigree. They read names, that's famous, that gets marketed well, but there's no performance. 100%. So we I just, just, just want to say that what you've said now. Yes. I've, I've tried to. I try to highlight it. Yes. Because what you said there now is so damn important. Because you can go on an auction and you'll see the performance birds, thousand rand. The marketed name brand fashion yeah, bit. Yeah. So, so, so we look yeah, no. first at performance. Yeah. And I've actually I've worked out a little formula that anybody can use. And it, it's all about the bird that you buy, mm -hmm. its parents and the grandparents. If you count those, the bird itself is one, parents another two, grandparents another four. So that's seven birds. Mm -hmm. If you don't count at least four winners amongst those seven birds. Just okay, so that's awesome. Let's re, re uh, so yes. just so that the guys can yes. uh, catch it up properly. So between the bird you buy, the two parents and, and the four, and the four grandparents, there's seven birds. There's seven birds. So four of them, four of them has to be winners, as pigeons, performers. or performers, or breeders of winners. So you know, obviously, you get a stump fodder sometimes that didn't run. Yes, but you can see. That cock has been seven eight 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 eight. Yeah. So obviously then that counts. Okay, I like that. But I like it. if you look at a pedigree, you've got the birds, its parents, its grandparents, mm -hmm. and there's only one winner amongst those. And the, the, the real performers are in the great grandparents or further back. Well the brother and sister that you Your know. chances of getting a good one is so diluted that it's I'm not saying you can't buy a winner like that. Of mm -hmm. course you can you can buy a no, fantastic winner, but your chances, it's all about hit rate. Hit rate increasing your chances. So mm -hmm. if you study a pedigree and you see, listen man, mm -hmm. this baby that I'm buying now, well both the, both parents are winners. Mm -hmm. And the grandparents are winners and once the grand, grand, grand parent, great grandparents is also winners. Yeah. You can't go wrong. Yeah. Fantastic. I like that little recipe. So yeah, so uh, just to pick up where we were in terms of uh, selection. So what, what helps us a lot is because there's a demand for our birds, we get to spread them across the country. Okay. So to give you so, some stats on that. So just, and, and just before you go on that, what obviously a, a, lot of, a lot of talk goes on here in, yes. in the shop. Yes. And um, what your name comes up with a lot, um, and you'll tell me if I'm right, if I'm wrong, um, is and then, you, and then you must tell me how how you do it because I think that's very important for for the sport as a whole. Is that you assist a lot of fanciers. You know, a lot of guys sell birds. Yes. But not a lot of guys sell and then assist or trial and assist. Yes. So how do you how so, do you fit so how do you so fit all that in? It, it's got to do with with first. Uh, my and my son's love for the sport. Yes. That's where it starts. 100%. So if you look at the but sport... So I can, but so I can say about a lot of, a lot of other guys. Yes. But, but, but if you want the sport to survive in South Africa and worldwide, mm. but specifically here in South Africa, the luxury of keeping secrets mm. is long gone. Oh, because please, please say that again. The luxury of keeping secrets, if you're a champion, is long gone. Because the, 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 the gap, the divide between the guys that have got good birds and that has the knowledge and the beginner in terms of just starting out cost has become prohibitive. Mm. So, I mean, even, I mean, there are positive things in the sport at the moment that the demographic, I think, has changed. Yes, yes. A lot of guys with money are coming into the sport. Yes. But as with any sport, by definition, competition, People don't like losing. Yeah, you know? And now you've laid out 50 grand or 100 grand in terms of the loft and birds and whatever, and you get smashed every week. What does that do? It kills it. It kills it there. I mean, long gone are the days that when my dad wanted to join 
Northern Districts Club in 1974. Mm -hmm. There was a waiting list. He couldn't get in. Sure. He had to wait two years to race against Monty van der Berg and Jack Wright and those guys. Those days are gone. So it's become the responsibility of champions to not only take all the time. You've got to get it. So now, so we, get, we, get to, we, we get, I mean, if I say I get phone calls every day, I don't exaggerate. Uh, well, I've been, I've been to visit you and the phone hasn't stopped. So this time of year, mid-February to mid-April, I think it's probably the busiest because people's birds are dying. You know? mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure they come in here as mm -hmm. well. And we can talk about that a little yeah. bit later as well. But I actually spoke, I had a podcast with Doc Roddy yesterday. Yes. Because he's just been to a conference, a vets conference in Germany or Belgium. Yes. And they brought up all that. So we can discuss it a bit. Yeah. All right. um, but across the, the board, right across the season, you know, I've become, I don't know why, but it's because I'm open. You know, and I tell people the truth. So if you do this, this is going to happen and you're going to fight better. Mm -hmm. it, it yeah. Really does. yeah. So we get a lot of requests to sell our program, mm -hmm. and I don't need it. I'd rather give it away, but then you must help me as well. Mm -hmm. So get some babies from us. So if you, if you buy five babies from us, here's the program, and you get my time. So that's my philosophy. And that way... I so there's no limit it. on your time. They can find you whenever. They do. Whenever. They, <laughs> they do. <laughs> the, 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 the record, according to my wife, <laughs> is that on one day she went through my phone, I had 87 incoming calls from different taxes. Sure. Yeah. 87. That's hectic. Yeah. So that is, is hectic. Yeah. But the good thing now is it's actually taken off a little bit because well, the, the guys, guys, are, the guys that do well now yeah. have their own you know, circle of friends, five or six guys. And so, I mean, people start phoning me now that I don't know. And they say, you know, you're using this milk and vinegar program. How do I do well, this? How do I do that? That's one of the controversial questions that we're going to yeah. come up to. How, how, do you, how do you give this? Mm. And I say, where did you hear this? And, I, and then he'll tell me, no, you're from this guy, which I also don't know. And then I find out, oh, okay. But I told that guy Kimberly, I told him about this, okay. and that's how I've got to him, and, and that makes me smile, because yeah. the one thing, the big problem in this sport at the moment, we spoke about it earlier, is jealousy. Oh, that's terrible. But where does that come from? The fact is that there are too few winners it's in terms of racing. There, there are, but I, I also just want to touch, and, 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 and this is a very sore point for me. Yes. Because um, I've travelled around Europe, you know, I've gone with Rogan yes. and I've gone with Tyron again, and and their outlook there is completely different, yes. completely different to South Africans. That's why I call it the South Africanism. When we we get to Kuipat, um, he says, "There's, I'm just giving an example now. There's a, my cock mated to a hen from yes, Prana. Yes, correct. So they swap they swap pigeons. So yes. Oh, okay." Come just, and it's often, eh? Yes. Often, 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 often. The top guys do it all the all time. But also, I mean, we have to be honest about it. That it's not everybody that does it overseas. I've got a lot, many, of it, a, a lot of it happens. It does. The other thing that also happens overseas, which doesn't happen here, yes. is if I've got a so called clickbait, yes. none of them leave my loft. None of them leave no. my loft. I will not sell no, one or two areas that's overseas that I've got a out of like say the Tom Tom Lock super I've got a son, I've got yes. a daughter. Yes. And then that loft flourishes. Yes. Not South Africa. Yeah. Except but, the Tom. Yeah. To me it's different, you know. Um No, I know with you it's different. For, I know with you it's different. For me, you know, if I've got a close friend and I, and I only have a handful. Yeah. But we interchange birds and that every time is a huge yeah. I, I can't say that in any but, of those instances. But if I can ask you, why do you think it's a South African? I mean, we touched on the jealousy part, but I just. I, I think it's you know it's a cultural thing. I think it's it's you know yeah, South yeah. Africans. Obviously, all love winning, but even worse than that, South Africans hate losing. Yeah. And that's the problem in the sport is that there are not enough winners. So we must yeah. solve that. Yeah. So you know, if a guy starts out. 
I don't think new people have a problem that I use his name. He's a guy that started out with pigeons in Kimberley last year. Okay. Hasn't raised pigeons in his life. I think his dad might have raised, but he hasn't raised. Right. So he's, he's got zero knowledge. So I said to him, let's just start right. He got birds from other guys, got birds from us, and only had young birds. And I think in the end, you know, he ended up thinking the young, only focused on the young birds. Yeah, I think in his federation, he, he ended six or seven. Yeah, fantastic. And he had a fantastic win with one of our birds. Yeah, one nice. of our nice so, so that guy is now. But he's hooked now. He's part of the sport. The guy now he's, his wife loves it. Yeah. She's taken, she's a fantastic administrator. Yeah. So now that one, you know, maybe it was in the beginning, it was a half an hour a day, and now it's maybe 10 minutes a week. But just that little bit of time spent with him yeah. has now, he, he's in it. Yeah. And he's positive, and he wants to bring in new friends of his. And, you know, so we need to create more friends. So, how do we do that? That's my next question. Yes. So, my view is, is that I think, and you said Fanny has, has covered it before with me as well, the administration of racing business in South Africa needs to go from amateur to professional. I think we probably one of the very few sport, sports, if not the only sport, we, we don't have leagues. No. So, <laughs> Uh, the first union champion last year uh, in GPU. GPU. Probably Kevin. So Kevin races fantastic. He's come top, from, top, yeah, top from a yeah. generational pigeon yeah. here. He's got the best birds when he races like a champion. Mm. So there's a guy that starts. He has to compete on a level footing with that guy. It's not possible. See, I, I proposed that a few years ago, similar to a handicap, similar to a league. Where Just as a league, so, so there's it's still a big result, but you've got to get people of the same ilk competing against each other. So even if there are just four beginners yeah. in, the, in that league racing against each other, and you go through a promotion relegation type yes, of thing, yes, yes, yes. it keeps it interesting, and you get more winners. Yeah. So that just from an administrative point. The other thing is, I think, one of the main reasons why we're suffering in South Africa at the moment is because of, now, this time of year, people lose babies. They die in their thousands. And I know it because they phone me. Mm. People pick up the phone and say, I bred 62 babies. <clears throat> this morning, I counted 22 left. Please help. I found it a lot less this year in the shop. I don't know if you found it less. I found it a lot less this year. That, I, I also had that opinion until sort of the weekend when it oh, stopped. Okay. So, so I'm probably going to come out. I predict that yeah, in the next two weeks. Yeah. And some of the, the one off races are having problems at the moment. Yeah. You know, so if they are having problems, it's, look, it's in South Africa. It's, it's and I put it to sort of February to April. Same what do you yeah. what do you do you get it in your loft and then what do you not do anymore you? because I know how to manage it. But so I think it starts, so starts so off. It's very important that we hear a little bit about that management of yours. Yeah. You so, you mentioned. so I think it Is starts it no I don't. You know, it's just a theory and I've yeah. discussed it with some of the vets and I think um, the majority of them would agree that it starts with using let's call it inferior vaccines against parenting. Okay. So, uh, my suggestion to them and to Sampa is, is that there should be an investigation in terms of the quality of vaccines that get sold in the market. Mm -hmm. Because it's crazy. <laughs> if a guy finds me, I'll tell him, I think you vaccinated with this and you did it then, and these are the symptoms, and this is how the this, this, the illness progressed in your loft. And he'd say, you're exactly okay. right. Okay, so what do you vaccinate? So we only use nebulous paramexa. Okay, so, it's so it is expensive. But, as I say to many of the guys who complain about the price, the six rand or seven rand that you spend on your bird the price saves the you probably more than 100 rand yeah. on that bird in the longer run. Because once it's got so ill, yeah. the chances that it will be a good racer is virtually nothing. Now you've spent three months, four months, 
you know, raising this baby, and you can't use it. Yeah. You know? I worked the, out the other day, I've got a little formula that people can use to work out the cost of keeping pigeons. So the base cost of keeping pigeons in South Africa is somewhere around 70 cents per day. Then you're just feeding and keeping them out. The basics. The basics. Then you haven't raised, you haven't done nothing. So if you take that as a fact and you start making the sums, <laughs> that, and you've got a hundred birds, yeah. that's 70 bucks a day times 30 is two, two grand a month. Yeah. Now you lose half of them or more than where does the cost go? Yeah. So I think it starts with that, and then I just have a... And strangely a, enough, I mentioned that yesterday, and that was my fault, that the vaccines... It starts with that. It starts with the vaccines. Because in the lofts that do no less paramedics on it, and not once, more than once, mm. the problems are either zero, zero. or less than 2%. You yeah. might get one or two, one or two but it's, but it's, it's close it's, to zero. It's very close to zero. Yeah. And I think, in our own experience, the more often you can vaccinate, the less the problems become. And I've now seen in birds that are on the verge, there are other sick ones already. Mm -hmm. So let's say half the loft is still healthy, and the other half is sick or dying. Mm -hmm. The half that are healthy, mm -hmm. if you vaccinate them, they go through. No problem. There's no more deaths. Okay. And so there's a theory that it's a virus. I don't buy into that because if you catch it early enough, you can treat. So if you use something that's got oxycillin, pyrrhotidone, pyrrhophenicol, or the combination, yes, it, it, it clears it up. It gives you time to get them healthy if you vaccinate. Okay. So my theory is is that it's a strain of salmonella, I think. I don't have proof of that. No, 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 but it's fair but, enough. I mean, you, <coughs> but you why I say that, so, yeah. I, I also have fact that the guys who have tested with with the salmonella test kit, more than 90% test positive. Okay, so I just want to give you a stat that came out of yesterday's conversation. Um, <coughs> in Belgium, I know. Yes. Um, of the sick birds that were tested, I'm just going to correct, but you'll hear it on the, on the podcast with Dr. Marty. On the sick birds that were tested, 72% tested positive for beta. Yes. So that is the major problem. And I think what happened was the last year of the million dollar, mm -hmm. when they had that week when thousands of pigeons died. Yeah. The, the rest of them that survived and went into the market after the race were all carriers. And yeah. salmonella, as you know, beta, when carriers. once a bird has had it, it stays a carrier. Yeah. You can cure it, mm. and you can breed from it, no problem. But unless you take precautions, mm. the babies will get it. And they, it's crazy. It's usually only when they become adolescents. Yeah. So when they are like three and a half, four months old, yeah, perfect, yeah. boom, suddenly, you know, this, today it's they're fine, tomorrow, tomorrow the first thing, and that's the other thing I think that uh, this time of year is the most important in terms of fences observation. You know, if I can give a tip to people, yes. to fences out there, go to your loft twice a day, just spend half an hour just feeding your own birds. Yes. So you, the first thing that happens is it loses an appetite. So yesterday they were fine, lucky flying around the loft. This morning you want to call them in. <clears throat> Let's say you've got 30 babies. 25 will rush in, 5 will sit on the roof outside, have no interest, mm. and they don't eat, that's a start. So if you can start treatment that day, you'll save them all. Okay. Yeah. And so the treatments you mean like the furazole? The furazole, the, yeah. The, mixture. the products we use, you know, there's no, well, I think anybody knows yeah. that, we use uh, Derek Strix Ultimate okay. as, as a base. Okay. And then the Moxicillin from him as well. Okay. Or from wherever, yeah. wherever you can get it. Yeah. So, um, those things together work, but other guys that can't get it, if you mix your result, chlorophenicol, amoxicillin, it works. Oh. It works. Okay. And the stronger the amoxicillin component, the better. So I, on that point then, um, you're saying, because this time of the year now, the birds obviously starting to molt. Yes. They're starting to throw, it doesn't affect the molt. It doesn't, it doesn't at all. At all. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can treat. So in last two weeks, it's become mox nothing. Nothing. Zero. Okay. So in the last that it 
is very prevalent. It usually takes four, five, maybe six treatments before you've won the, the war. Okay. So and when you say treatments, I say three, four days at a yeah, time? four days at a time, once a month, maybe until the end of April. Okay. And then the strangest thing is, during the racing season, you can test. You won't find someone who races anywhere. Anywhere, it's clear. Why? I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, this whole problem, sure. and that, that's why, you know, I'd actually like the, the powers that be, the same powers of the world, to be involved. Mm -hmm. Because it's hurting our sport. What yeah. it does now, and it's hurting us from a cost point of view. Because what happens is, because the guy suffered the same fate last year, this year he breeds double. Mm -hmm. Now he's introduced another problem, overcrowding. Mm -hmm. He hasn't, he, he still vaccinates with the cheapest vaccine. Yeah. He changes nothing, he just breeds more. Yeah. So what does he do? He exacerbates that problem. He just, he multiplies it. So last year he lost 30 babies, now there's 70 dead. What's your view on vaccinating for I did it once many years ago and it wasn't successful. And because I think vaccinating for a bacteria is, the other, is, what the doc said yesterday. is not the greatest. Yeah. So, and you know, if you catch this thing early enough, it's so easy to cure. Yeah. I had one example last year where a guy phoned me when I think three or four birds were already very sick and one was dead. Mm -hmm. And luckily he had the stuff. So you put them on immediately. And if that was on a Saturday. On the Wednesday he phoned me, he said he can't believe his birds were ever sick. They range in for turn off out. Sure. Same birds that were nearly dying yeah. three, four days ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not difficult to cure when you catch it early. So then then this question I'm gonna to throw at you then, because then a lot of guys are saying it's the right to virus. And and you and I had the discussion last year. I don't think it is. I'll tell you why. I've yeah. got a very good friend in Australia, yeah. <clears throat> in Brisbane, yeah. who went through the whole rotavirus thing. Okay. And why he explained to me... Because they developed the vaccine there, eh? Yes, the first rotavirus yeah. vaccine was. Yeah. What he explained to me is not what we have here. So give us... Then, give us so give so us the, the big difference yeah. is... is the that, is, yeah. Yeah, that rotavirus attacked all the birds. Young birds, old birds, stock birds. Oh, okay, so that's all of them died. Yeah. And once it started, no matter what you did, you couldn't stop it. With this one, if you catch it early enough and you give the right antibiotics, they get over it. So it can't be a virus. So it can't be a virus, yeah. So, and now the stats are starting to back it up. In my own opinion, 90% of the guys who test for someone they get it positive, and you say in Europe for 70%. 70%, yeah. So, I think it's probably become what the doctors would call a syndrome. So the fact that you didn't vaccinate with the right vaccine puts the bird's immune system under pressure. So now you've bred many because last year you lost, lost a lot. You've got too many in the lot. And as you would know, the molting season is probably the most stressful for the poor bird. And the most important. And the most important. Exactly. Exactly. So it's the time of year you as a fancier actually has to be the most vigilant. Yeah. You know, you've got to be there every day yeah. and check them out because they're under stress. Yeah. So now because of the fact that they're under stress and you didn't write a vaccine correctly and in your loft, and I haven't been to one loft, and if I say I've been in the last four years to, let's say close on 500 lofts, yeah. I'm not exaggerating. Yeah. I haven't seen one loft that's someone that I've not one. You can see the signs everywhere. Give us a bit of those signs so the guys can know what to look for. Because I mean your experience yeah. compared to some of us. So so what I usually see is on the feathering, stew flights. And a lot of explain that stew flights, huh? Because so we're talking about the twisted flight. The twisted flight or the shaft shows a yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And often it's in the tail. You've got to look carefully, but you see the center. Especially in that last Exactly. Top top. So, so that to me is, and then in most lofts, you can see the droppings. You know, 100%. You can, right. Yeah, and we, what happens is once a bird has had it, he becomes resistant, but he's not healthy. Yeah. You can see it in his droppings yeah. and his smell. If I get to a loft you without entering, yes. I can tell this guy he's got some vanilla. He's sounding nervous. 
Should I smell it? It's got to smell to it. It's, you know, like I'm trying to try, try and explain that to us. It's, it's, like, a, a, it's like, like a rancid. Is it a rancid? Rancid smell. Because it's not that fresh dropping smell. No, that not that really. Like no, it's like an old rancid, you know, a place that's been closed for a long time. Although the, the lofts are open. open. Yeah. Okay, I understand exactly what you're talking about. You can about. smell it. Yeah. So, you would and then you usually when I see that, that, I get that about you, yeah. you know, when people find me now to please come help. I take them out with someone that I get with. Yes. Because people don't believe it. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now I've given uh, other well, stuff, yeah, whatever. Yeah. I can't have it. I've treated for it. Mm -hmm. you know? Especially a product like Biotrol or you know, Floxacin. It was it's very, very, very popular stuff. Yeah. But it's not effective against this drug. So I go there and I test. It's impossible. Just add them some 10 days of Biotrol. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just add them on it. It's totally resistant to it. So if I may ask you then, what, in your experience, what's been the most successful treatment for it, medicine-wise? Yeah, so this time, yeah, yeah definitely for, for, for sure you can use, uh, I think aviomine stylophilacure is very good. Yeah. Um, although I, I had a discussion before, Kenny wouldn't mind me saying that. Uh, I advised him to up the multicillin content. Okay. Um, so in his range, I think bacillin wing is very good yeah. to give. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't have the furazol component, which, yeah. for some other reason, the three together just mm. kills the thing. Works. Because it's crazy. If you test today, before your treatment, you'll see both lines on that kit, like shining at you. Okay. Tomorrow evening, after 24 hours, oh, it's gone. Like gone. In you can't see it. And immediately the birds start eating again, and yeah. the next day the droplets are there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But don't wait until it's, you know, once the eyes start closing yes. and you get, it looks like ornithosis. Yeah. It's not. It's not. Because then people see that and they try doxy and well, it doesn't work. Oxy. Yeah. That, you actually then make it worse. Yeah. Because then you put the bird under more stress. Under more stress. But if you give the right stuff, it actually yeah. does it quite quickly. So my suggestion is. Yes. If possible, the guys must test. And well, they can because the met have got the, yeah, the kids. Yeah. yeah. Test and once you see it's positive, then start treatment, and then test after three weeks again. If you because usually it does come back. Yes. And as I said to you, some lofts it's so deeply seated in that loft that it takes not months, maybe even years. I've got one friend. Um, we now in the third year that we're involved there, and only now we can start seeing that the problem is not coming back. It's gone. It's gone. Yeah. Yeah. It's gone. It's gone now. Yeah. So when he tests after three months, it's still good. Okay. So if you've got that under control, mm. the rest of, and you know, then don't give other monkeys. You know, only mm. treat a bird when they need it. And, and it's difficult. Uh, uh, you know that it's difficult, yes, there, because first of all, South African fanciers, we're all qualified vets. Yeah, but, but, nature, people, but, but we don't have... We do have, like we've got Dr. Karate comes here and he goes to Turf Pets and he goes to a Pretoria Pet Shop. Yes, yes. No, and he yes. goes, he goes to PE, he yes, goes to he goes all over. So he, got, he does do the test. He does test. a great job. Yeah, he does a great job. So that helps a lot. Yeah. But not everybody takes it seriously or comes, they just treat blindly. Yeah. To me, how do you, how do you, how do you... We test for some of the yeah, Often. Often. Um, do you test at home? Do you at home? No, and you test at home. Okay, so you jacked up and you've yes. got your mask. So we, well, some of those you've got the test. Got the test kit. So, yeah. so, and that's why the vets don't like me so much. <laughs> <laughs> Is that we found a way with the milk and vinegar that. So we, that's the controversial one that I was yeah. going to come up. With. So the milk and vinegar solves canker. Explain for, for some explain, other crazy reason. Explain that to us because that's come in the shop yourself. So, so and it's made yeah. Shake the heads and I can't, uh, this cannot be. It is. And, I, it's, uh, it's and I've been saying, and I've been thinking that now, when I get you on the podcast, I'm putting you on the yeah. spot. Yeah. Explain the milk and the vinegar milk. and yeah. the canker yeah. cure. So, many other fanciers use other stuff to acidify the crop. You know, yeah. the, the guys that use uh, lemon juice, juice, lemon juice, 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 juice apple or, cider, or acid pack, four by acid two. Pack. All those good yeah. things. It, they all do this, the same thing. <clears throat> a pigeon's crop, 
by nature, if you test the acidity, is either seven between seven and seven point two. Okay. On the pH, yeah, pH reading. So let me quickly tell you the story of how I got into yeah, yeah, yeah. In 2015, a guy started racing with us who never raced before, and uh, I vividly remember him coming uh, to want to buy babies in. I think it was end of January. And um, I said, I don't have, but I can give you a stock baby for free, but please don't go and race it. Yeah. It's still directly out of my dummy fingers, the whole sister to the sunset anyway. with it. She was 12 years old, said, please don't race it. And then when the season came, I remember that first race, I'll never forget it. I'll, I saw that basket on the table, and the babies were, I think, less than four months old because they weren't shiny feathers. Yeah, a shiny feather. There so is no, a, and I thought that's not even an apex. Not fucking sorry, excuse me. In my basket, there were three and four tonne winners. It was a sprint race, an open race. So Saturday came and we found each other and you know the times. Mm -hmm. And I went to the club very confident. And it so happened that he had the first uh, bending block in our club. And I printed the. Of the race results. Yes. And at the time, I think there were 15 or 16 of us. We still had the winning time when we got his clock. And I gave him over five about four minutes. So I worked my brain off. I clocked at 33. Mm -hmm. So I said, if he clocks 38, that will be close. Yeah, close, yeah. But I should have him. Yeah. So the print went, and it's only off the number came up, and it looked like an eight. And in my heart, I said, please go. <laughs> only the one. <laughs> Came back and it wasn't 38, it was 33. He was a 33. Yes, clocked the same time as no. And I was like, what? With and those baby, baby babies? And he clocked 13 together. Oh my word. And he demolished us that season. So I then went and I said, please explain. And he taught me about proper certification. And I thought, rubbish. My son, one, my older son, Said no, let's try it. And they had a little loft which Opa gave them four pairs. Okay. Old pigeons. The one cock was 17 years old and all the hens were older than 10 years. The previous season when they had them, the whole breeding season they raised one baby. Oh, <laughs> so this year they, they said no, they're going to try this milk and vinegar <coughs> stuff and, and so also food, food pellets. And, yeah. So. Um, we always start judging, selecting also, you know, on eggs, you know, bad eggs we throw away, empty eggs we throw away. Mm -hmm. So I had my rock loft with, I had the fanciest food in the world, you know. Uh, in those days, Niels Nell still imported natural. Uh, natural. Yes. yes. My whole garage was full of food. Yeah. Probably 30 grams worth of food. Um, and here we put them off in the new village. So after. Eight days the hens started laying, and my son said, No, the hens also lay. What do you mean they lay? Last year, the one hen's a 13 year old, she hasn't laid for four years. Impossible. So I went, There were two eggs. What's happening here? But I saw them, you know, they had cock fertility and infertility, and I thought to myself, Luck, and they, you know, they worked out. They boosted yeah, them. They, they obviously do their job mm -hmm. and good for them. So the once, after four days, then we look for fertility of the eggs and the bad eggs we throw away. So when I got to that loft, the fertility in the first round usually with us is around about 95 or 100 percent. Because those are pairs where you're also the key, and the cocks are the key. And it's not great. Yeah. So I got to that back loft, <clears throat> and uh, out of the eight eggs, seven were fertile. The veins were in the I couldn't believe it. But it didn't, the penny didn't drop until about a month later, when we went so, to ring the babies. But besides that, the quality of the eggs? Were fantastic. Okay, because that's just important. Fantastic. So a month later when we went to ring, Enrico was at school, and Richard was uh, busy studying. So it was me and Lemon, mm -hmm. my help, my right hand man at the lot. So I usually give him the rings and I write. So lacquer, we ring in the normal stock lot, no problem. We get to the wooden loft. We, the, we call them the Urdeva. Yeah. <laughs> so old. 
So you have to go up a couple of stairs. It was a the little playpen when the when they were young. They were young. So then he goes up and so I gave it and I gave him a strap. I said, Lemon, what's wrong? It's called me to ring some. I saw he said, No most I can't ring the birds. I said, I mean what, what do you mean what, you can't ring the birds? What, age, just, what age are they now? Seven, seven days. Seven days, yeah. Seven eight days. Mm -hmm. I said, but in the other loft you, you had no problem ringing birds. What's wrong? He said, no, they're too big. It's impossible. Bring those ringers. Because they, we used uh, more rings on those and the darbies and the oh, size. Yeah. Yeah. So I said, must be a difference in size. Yeah. So he brought me the darbies and these rings and I put the two together and that's when the penny dropped because there was no difference in no, size of the ring. No. And I went to those bay and I looked at them and they looked different. And when I went them on day 25... So did you, manage, did you manage to get the rings on? Yes. That's the ring. So on, uh, we usually win somewhere between 25 and 28 days. Mm -hmm. And on the day that we win the babies, it looked like two different sets of pigeons, totally. And then I understood. And we changed everything. And <clears throat> up to that year, so for the last five years before that, every year, come April, we had young bird disease. So now, the whole loft, the whole setup was on the Milton Munich and Pellets, basically from end of September. So the previous year, and Rob will tell you, I was probably his best customer. I was the offer <laughs> the bulls were sky. Yeah. Um, and then suddenly I found no signature. January, February, March, April came, and in my diary, I know, sort of by the middle of April, should be hitting you. Now, why would you, you've got to go early, switch on the lights, and then you listen because you hear the woman oh, calling yeah. there and there and there. The seat's falling. So, the, the whole. A terrible feeling. Though. Yeah. And the other thing I, I noticed then is these birds were flying like absolute mad things around the loft. You know, I couldn't get them down. Working well. Two and a half, three and a half, four Raging hours. Up. Gone. Like you get scared, you know, and I'm going, they're coming back. And. I always waited in those days for young bird to come and go before I start tossing. So the, the earlier I could get it, the better. The better yeah, yeah. So now the first uh, sort of be around the 27th of April, nothing happens. Yeah. They fly like mad. They go, you know, they're so fit. So at, by the end of the first week in May, when we didn't get sickness, I said to the kids, we must start tossing. Yeah. Yeah. Toss. And we can't do the normal five, five, ten, ten, ten. Mm -hmm. So we loaded them in the car and I told Richard go 50 guys. First off. First off. And we usually let them go in small batches. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, well if I, if we lose 30%, it's no mm -hmm. answer. I'm happy. Mm -hmm. So before they were back, all the birds were back. All the birds. Didn't lose one. Didn't lose one. Sure. So in that week before the race, I then said, well, I always test for canker. Let me quickly rush off and get them tested by mm -hmm. And I remember uh, it was in uh, Farid shop. I was, I think, fourth in line. Mm -hmm. I listened to the results, plus three, plus mm -hmm. four, one guy, plus six. Mm -hmm. I thought, so it's prevalent because of the stress in the beginning of the season. I'm going to get slaughtered here. You know, they probably yeah. all have very bad cases. And you haven't treated for cancer? Nothing! I haven't given a thing! I didn't do malaria, I didn't do detoxing, nothing. Done nothing. Just the milk. So I, I got to the front and I remember Rob testing the first one and the second one he looked at me and he said you clever, he treated these birds last night didn't he? Because they were zero, mm. zero, canker free, without treating them. Sure. So, yeah, you can ask everyone who's used milk and vinegar. If they go test... Well, well I'm going to ask you now, how, how do we use the milk and vinegar? So it's, yeah, it's... Quite simple. So yeah. the milk is a calf replacement, milk replacer, that they give to the little calves if the cow is milk oh, that's a, the, what's the name? It's uh, called Milk Bar. The company in Naismit makes it. Called okay. what? Milk Bar. Milk Bar. Yeah. So it's, so it's not normal milk? No, it's not normal milk. It's not, no, it's, it's not it's, colostrum there. It's got colostrum in it, obviously. Yeah. It's a byproduct of the, the Ladysmith company. It's called Ladysmith Powders. Okay. It's a byproduct of they make cheese. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
and then they get this product that they then you know powderize and, and so it's kind of that you yeah it's crazy I mean I spoke to the rep about a month ago yeah. six weeks ago and he said he can't believe it but his turnover has nearly doubled here yeah, I think I think of this <laughs> <laughs> okay. but in any case so yeah it's basically it's 20 grams of raw powder per liter yeah and then we had one and a half milliliter vinegar so it's still drinking water just do the drinking water and I get it every day throughout, throughout the year, except yes. in the racing season. Okay. We only give it on Sunday to Tuesday. So we, the Wednesday. That's Thursday, when you're treating canker. I don't. No, but I we mean, don't treat canker. But that why, is your why, canker. why would I treat canker? No, no, that is your canker treatment. Yes. That's well, what I mean, yeah. But now, the question I get often mm -hmm. is so you never give any canker meat? I said, no, that's not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. We do give canker meat, but not to treat canker. Some canker medicines have a fantastic effect. People will tell you, if you give this, the birds are better. 100%. Yeah. I know which ones are. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that's true. So, with, and, and what people don't understand is, and, and they ask, what do you give for respiratory? And they say, I don't give anything for respiratory. My birds are sick. But does that mean I don't give anything throughout the season? that purports to be mm -hmm. for respiratory? No, I do use it. Like, and, and every year there's a different muti that works well. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. give it as a curative. Antibiotics during the racing season has a different effect. It's got a stimulant effect. Why? Because yes, there are things in the pigeon that you need to suppress. Why? Think about uh, the cattle trade. Wrong the flocks and then mixing with all the yeah. yeah. So you won't get one chicken farm that doesn't give something to some sure. because they grow quick. In, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. So if you give the right <coughs> antibiotic at the right time, what the bird then encounters is the food that he eats gets absorbed more efficiently and gets yeah. stored more efficiently. Yeah, more energy. Better performance. Okay, so just going back one step now. We did. We so now I'm glad that we want that the milk and the vinegar. Is it vinegar or apple cider? No, not apple cider. And I'll tell you why. Yes. Because if you look at different brands of apple cider vinegar, mm -hmm. all of them have different acetic acid yeah. content. Some of them have five percent, some of them seven percent. There's some that only have two and a half percent. Mm -hmm. So I say buy the cheapest. We buy a five liter. Was 27 bucks, yeah, and it lasts you for even a month. Six and white vinegar, brown vinegar, brown, preferably brown vinegar. I don't know why, but it seems to work better. Okay, yeah. fair enough. But just it says imitation vinegar, five percent acetic acid. Mm, there you go. Okay, so for a loft of about a hundred birds, it will cost you less than four rand a day to keep your birds healthy. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. And then, then, so the step that I wanted to go back, you, you mentioned the vinegar and the milk, and I understand all of that now. Um, you mentioned pellets. Yes. Can you elaborate on that a little bit there? So, the analogy I always use is, is we as pigeon fans, we think we're very, very clever. We uh, always, we know, and, and, and we always do things better than the rest of people we, that we, are. We reinvent the wheel. Yeah, we, we, we farm with poultry. Yeah. And I would oh, say, yeah. the last stats I looked at, there's about 50 and a half million chicken farmers worldwide. Have you ever seen a chicken farm feeding wheaties, bees, sorghum? No, what do they feed? They feed a pellet. Mm -hmm. Into which millions of dollars of research and development has gone because their livelihoods depend on it. The world depends on chicken meat to survive, most of the world. Yeah, most of them. Yes. Yeah. And do they give separate little things to their birds? A mix? Have you seen any serious chicken farmer who does feed like that? No. He feeds pellets. Because why? It's balanced, it's easily digestible, it's all, and it's controlled. Okay, but the question's going to come. The yes. question's going to come. Um, fair enough, but that's for chickens and that's for poultry. Yes, so which pet is a good question because yes. a lot of pigeon fanciers look at the label and they always want to take the one with the most protein. Mm. No, take the one with the 
yeast protein. Wow. So the, the, I'll explain that now. Mm -hmm. The pellet we use is a layer pellet. So you can use any layer pellet. The one we use is, is from Afri, mm -hmm. and it contains 15% protein. The guys in the cap can't get it, and they use the one from Meadow, I think it's called Power Lay, mm -hmm. and it's only got 14%. It works just as well, or maybe even better. Okay. I'm just scared to cut myself because we you used to. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, why the lower protein? It's simple. If you look at any mix, breeding mix, high protein, whatever, mm -hmm. and specifically peas, the protein content of the pea is probably 25, 22, 25 percent. Mm -hmm. However, once your bird has digested it, it only uses a portion of it. It uses 30 percent of it. Probably. So, so it gets a little bit of protein out of that. Yes. So now I've got to take a step into our method. What we what I then found when I was on the milk vinegar birds mm -hmm. is the birds started different, uh, acting different when they came back from the races. Now I knew exactly how to catch every bird, spurge it, to get it ready. Yes. To to get it recovering so that you know by Tuesday, Wednesday I could start training again. You know, from so, so when you mention pellets, are you talking the whole year round? Yes. Not only and it's, do I only give it no, I'll okay. obviously also give my racing mix and stuff with it. But it certainly is it's the base. Yeah. So a lot of the guys that use this program only get pellets during the off season and breeding season. So the breeders breeders only get pellets. Okay. Yeah. And the babies are black birds. Yeah. And then I heard stories, now they grow too quick or this and that. And I said, look, look at the score. So the, the stats I can give you of the guys who give me feedback on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. It's about 55, 60 guys. Mm -hmm. Last year, between those 55, 60 guys, there were more than 1,000 club wins, more than 350 union wins. Yeah. And I think 42 club champions and 24 union champions. Yeah, yes. Hectic stats. The previous year when we went to the same is, is that on your program? Yes. And also your birds. Some are my birds, some are not. Okay. It's my program. Okay. So uh, the previous year on the same Medal Awards, I think there were seventeen different pigeons who got awards, mm -hmm. of which eight were on my program. And if you think that only so that's nearly half the birds that got medals were on the program. And if you think that less than two percent of the fraternity was using the program, so two percent of yeah, that's guys crazy. That's crazy, yeah. nearly five fifty percent of the medals, yeah. It says something something's right. Something's right. Something's right. But uh, something's right, but but um we're just touching on part of it because I would say that uh, it has to be the complete program. Yes. You can't just say it's only the So now, that was you're, the very, you're absolutely right. So now, does it work for everybody? No. Yeah. And, I, and I was wondering why. And it usually it doesn't work for guys that had previous success with different programs. Okay. And I'll tell you, I think I know why. Okay. With this program, this program enables you to race your birds literally every 18, 19 weeks in a row without once resting. Yeah. And it, is that the tossing in between? Yes. As well. Hard tossing. Hard tossing in between. If I see a hard race is coming, you I put two and, and a half hours of tossing in during the week. And then they've had an eight hour race the previous week. Okay. To give you an idea. But then so the previous also year, is, uh, I think you've developed that type of bird as well, right? Eh? It does, yeah. So, yeah, so it's, it's, it's transformed. Yes. There were birds that we were very successful with back in the early 2000s. We were union champion mm -hmm. often. And, I mean, we've had ace birds since I started racing. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of those birds aren't part of the package mix. I've now got a bird that really, the more you fly it, the better it becomes. The, the best example was last year when we had the Sanford Gold and Silver Medal on the long distance. So it's those so two can you birds. Give, give us an indication of how you raced those two birds. So they raced literally every race for 18 weeks, the six last races included, of which three were overnight races. So they only oh, yeah. come on Sunday, sure. probably 7 o'clock. And their condition obviously was good because I they would be. Yeah. That's why we, you know, the program is so. 
it's mind blowing. You know, it's just yeah. I, if I think about it today, I still can't believe. If I think ten years back, how long it took me to recover a bird that came back from an overnight race. I mean, and that's saying a lot, still, because you've both been successful for many, many yes. years. Eh? I mean, the best example is my dad until very late in his career, just before he passed away, actually, mm. didn't want to go into this program because he said he got he, you know, and they made new winners. <laughs> so the best example I can give you is the year before he passed away, I think it was the year of COVID. Yeah. Um, as soon as the restrictions were lifted, he went away with my mum to the park. Mm. And he said he doesn't want to race those last four yeah. five races. They're going to go for a minute. And he's got that virtue. And I said, Mark, we're going to race. He had a license to go to the club. Yeah. Yeah. So I said, I'm going to show you these birds. Because my dad always thought, I've got better birds than him. But it's not true. He had, obviously, a yeah, he had a yeah. So uh, I started the program, and within a week, the birds started winning. So much so that when he came back, I think it was two weeks before the end, they had a cold spurt. And he was racing against Arnie and you know, the really yeah, good man, that, was yeah. tough, that was a tough time. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. it still is. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. he clocked, he, he, we bossed seven birds on the one race and I think eight on the other. In the one race, he took the first five in the club and the other one the first four. Yeah. And those yeah. birds then were racing, well, basically their fourth race in the row. So then he realised, and then, yeah, you know, Unfortunately, never got to to see the whole, the whole thing. thing. Yeah. Yeah. But as your long story short, short, so the program works well if you've got few birds and you can race them off. You know, yeah. so yeah. if you've got a team of 130 and your method says once you go past Goldsburg or 580 for other guys mm. in the country, you race in other direction. Yeah. But once you go past 580, many guys then race one week rest, one week rest, one week. Oh, oh, yeah. And even on the longer distances, maybe yeah, even, weeks. even three weeks, you know. Yeah. So yeah. it doesn't work that well for them. But it just it's 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 crazy. You know, the birds just seem to go better and better. We saw it when we had our first gold medal winner in 2019. Mm. Phenomenal race. So when we started racing the um, the, the first week she went over 450, she won, and we th thought, like, oh, well, you got going back. Okay. Second week, the same thing, third week, the same thing, fourth week. Now you're starting thinking medals, you know. She's mm -hmm. already scored then four times in the first nine of the inning. So I said to Enrique, oh, I don't want to race her anymore. You can do that. So on a Thursday, you'd get to the loft and she'd look at you, and she'd look better. Catch her, better yeah. form. And so it happened that for seven weeks she was never out of the top nine in the union. And that was starting at 450 in the second week. And and before the 450 as she raced? Every sprint race. Every yeah. sprint race yeah. she had once. Yes. So now so I think sometimes you gotta have a little bit of guts to do the program as well. Yes. Because and a lot of people find it very hard to do yes, that. Yes. Especially when the bird starts winning. Yes, I'd be one of those. By the, third, by the oh, third, yeah. third week, that bird's been in the first. So the two medal winners on the long distance, mm -hmm. both of them were in the first 10 for four races running in the union. And still I put them yeah. back. That's what I put them back. But you get that confidence because when you handle them for the run, to, at you, basket, you, you, you know, they're they, 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 they yeah. handled this. Yeah. And they're ready, you know, you can see yeah, it. You can see it yeah. Do you race widow herd or do you race no. mixed? Do you race no, I mean, the, the young birds we, we keep mixed. Yeah. Um, until about a week before the dog. As soon as I see the heads starting getting breeding going to the corners, I split them. Mm -hmm. The old birds we fly split all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, yeah. it's nothing like that. Nothing like that too. No. It's very simple. I mean, if <laughs> you know, so, but, but you don't race like Cox one weekend. On the yeah, weekend. I think to come back to the program, the other thing that becomes very really simple is feeding because they can never over, overeat. How can I don't know? They, if you so come to the loft one day, you feed as much as they want. Yes, so after they've ate, uh, they've eaten their stuff, 
We leave the food in the troughs for another two hours. Then they will go and pick it up, whatever is left. Right. But they, they're never hungry. So, so there's no stress on... So uh, that's why a lot of guys that come from a different sort of mindset, they like way of measuring. measuring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that doesn't work with this program. Okay. So this program works like this. If, if it's cold, they eat the hell out of them. Once it becomes hot, they eat a little. <laughs> and I don't care because they eat they what they need. Yes. Yeah. Do you find though that they that they feeling like that a lot of guys, that's why a lot of guys don't feed like that, is the birds seem to choose the wrong seeds? So, to yes, especially when you start feeding things like uh, diaz and sun, uh, diaz diaz sun and, 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 and peanuts and, peanuts and, and that kind of stuff. So, those are all part of the program. And for us, people ask me, give me your feeding program, and I, I really don't have a fixed one. Mm -hmm. Because every week is different. different I, I look yeah. on a Sunday, and yeah, that's another reason why we get called so much is yeah, pretty accurate with what's going to happen with the next day. Yeah. So if I see it's going to be a, a 1200 or a hard race. So don't cut me off in the season <laughs> when I'm going to see when I'm on the so, so then we, f we feed more carbs mm -hmm. earlier in the week. Yeah. But if I see it's going to be a 1450 quiet last day, mm -hmm. four and a half hour race. So I obviously use sunflower as well because I keep my sunflower and mix a little bit longer. So it's it's different. Mm. We also feed it uh, and find seed mix. Yeah. But it's that's intuition. I think you know that's yeah, where yeah. you've got to you be a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And and a lot of guys don't have it, and that's yeah. why they call. You know. Yeah. So we food on TV. Yeah. And then I just no, I say, listen. Let's do it this way. I'm not always right, but. If you can be right most of the time, you are yeah. 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 Because then you compare the birds correctly. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. then um, tell us a little bit more about we've touched on it basically but not not enough on the success of the painter patches around the country. Uh, yeah. so, or not I shouldn't say paint the patches, but yeah. paint the birds. Yeah. So it's it's and it's, how that because five years ago there were basically two sets of birds. The painted batteries and what I call the new generations. But now okay. there's a new family and I can just call them the painters okay. because yeah. they, they have the blood of, of all four of those base birds. Um, okay. So they're basically painters. Now. Yeah. And the one thing that I'll never forget uh, from when I was like 10 or 11 years old, mm. uh, Monty van der Berg lived about two days from my dad's house. And in those days, I just went with a bike, you know, mm -hmm. it was good. And then I stopped at Monty and he said, oh, you know, always when, when you've got a family of birds, mm -hmm. look at them physically and understand where they are strong and where they are weak. Mm -hmm. And if you bring stuff in, they must be the same type. That's the word he used. Yeah, yes, yes. So if you look at our birds today, a lot of people that knew the old patties would say, yeah, the little squint patties. Mm. But it's not true. What we've done, though, is the birds that we brought in the are the yeah. similar type mm. and the similar talent. Is it the right way? I, yeah, I think we, we do pretty well. Right. Right. Yeah, it's definitely. But I must also say that to fly well in South Africa these days, to win the union points, or combine points or whatever. Whatever, any organization Yes, points. and it's and strong all over. All over. Yeah. Well, that, that strong all over, I just think out in the outlying area, it's my opinion. Yes. I think it's a little tougher because the guys are so widespread. Yeah, well, you can have to have clever birds a week. Yeah, well, you know. So, I find it, you know, that... I don't know how your organization... I'll tell you a little bit about that now. Yeah. But you have to have versatility in your life because it was... It, you know, I'm a student of the sport, so I look at where and who does what, mm -hmm. with what. Mm -hmm. So let's take the GPU, for instance. Mm -hmm. I'd be very surprised if you look at the top 10 guys that they don't have Tom Locke as a base or some of Whitey's, mm -hmm. you know, old Joe stuff. Mm -hmm. and so it's basically become... Yeah, we've all got that. Yeah. And they, so... <laughs> I can tell you before the race comes, if there's a southeaster, not one of those guys are doing well. Some some other guys do well. Mm -hmm. And it's because they don't have versatility in their life. 
And okay. so what we've been exposed to where we live is that the towns are quite far apart, especially in our second union. We, and you know, we, give us, give we're very fortunate. So we, we able to race in two units where we live. So we race in WRPA, which, which is basically West Grand. our Western. So yeah. it comes from Fulfill, Western okay. Area, Coltonville, Ranchon, sure. Team, Krugersdorp, Mechanisburg. Okay. Wow. And then we belong to the Gauteng West Combine, that includes the western side of Pretoria. Yeah. So all the guys basically from the South Corp stuff. The Federation. The Federation. Yeah. Yeah. So it's... it's so that's why. It's, it's, so from north to south, 110 k's. Sure. And from east to west, probably about 50 k's. Yeah. Yeah. So it's... No, it's big. But the PSWU, mm -hmm. which is our second union, is even bigger. So you've got guys living in Rustenburg, Moino and Brits. Uh, that races against guys that live in Fort Full Western Area Krugers. Yeah, and what what that's been good for us is it's exposed us to different types of bird. You know, you get you, the intelligence a bird has to have in those areas. Yeah, there's nothing of that. There's that no big, there's another big pool in yeah. uh, um, yeah. competition. No, so so you'll you'll find that the wind plays less of a role. Um, it still does play a role, obviously. Mm. But if your bird can break early enough, you know, that's the good thing about where we live. <clears throat> we live in the middle, sort of, of Kruger's door. So our main competition all live, I'd say, between 3 and 5 k's, 7 k's to the southeast mm -hmm. of us. Mm -hmm. But then we've also got very stiff competition to the west of us. So you're racing both? Both, both unions, yeah. And how did you do from my asking those two? So yeah, last year we were union champion for, I think, the fourth time in the last five years. In yeah, which organisation? Okay. So that's always been our main focus. Yeah. In total, I think we've been champion six times. Um, six or seven. And that's a very strong organisation. Yeah, it is very yeah. strong. I mean, this year, again, if you look at the San Pamela Awards, I think, per capita, the WRPA by far and away. I know some of the fences there, so I know. Very, very, very. I think there are five or six guys from the WRPA who's receiving medals. So it's, it's really tough. I mean, guys like Devil and William Warner, they, they, you know, they are the most stiff, serious. stiff opposition. I mean, yeah. there are so many GJPs. Uh, yeah. you know, it's really tough. Mounts there as well. Mounts in, yeah. 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 Um, I can go on these. Yeah, really yeah, fantastic fans. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. John Funner Boss. Uh, yeah, so there are a couple of good ones. Yeah, yeah, he's from. Yeah. Um, so, previous, uh, up to about 2021, we raced the PSW basically to test. So we never raced a full season. Yeah. We went to go up to sort of about the dog. Yeah. Yeah. So if the bird then shows promise, it comes to the right. yeah. Yeah. So those were yeah, usually that So the A and B teams were in the WRPA, firstly the main program and the sprints, and then we'd fly the PSWU program and the sprints. Yeah. So last year we were fortunate that in three of the four competitions, so WRPA overall and sprints, and the PSWU sprints, we won the competition sure. first, and, and on the main competition, the PSWU we were second. And the reason why <laughs> you always, you know, hindsight is twenty 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 vision because <clears throat> you unnecessarily focus too much on the one yeah. neglect because nobody can, you know, the competition well, is always so so always so 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 very strong. strong. But the fact that the birds did so well, so we flew ninety eight races last year in the club, yeah, yeah of which we won fifty seven. Yes, you yeah. like 60% of the races. Yes. And uh, in the unions, I think in total we won about 17, 18. That unions. is excellent. Yeah. So to come yeah, back to some record, eh? very, I'm very proud of it. But I must say, I, at this stage, mm. I get more pleasure from other guys than all the birds. So last year, we had about yeah. 70 babies countrywide. And just wish more, more guys were like that. Yeah, to me, it's so important. You know, that's yeah. It gives me pleasure. Yeah, it gives you pleasure. No, and I, I understand it fully. And our philosophy is to be good, not only good races, but to to to, to establish a breed that's got a legacy. Yeah. 
that does well. Not no, I, mean, I think that's already come from a long time ago. Yes, but because it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing battle. Right? Because, because now, yeah, now we've, 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 we've saddled up another horse with one on racing, which yeah. didn't take part in since my dad yes. you know, won the Sun City yeah. race. Um, for many years, we just didn't take part. Yeah. But now, it's become... You did well in Africa, Pro. We did well. But there's room for improvement. So that's why we always look to always improve. But I, I because I, that's another thing that you know, I think that's lacking in South African sport is we don't have like a ranking of fences. No. If you give me the top 10 fences in the country, you can't. I, can't. I can only tell you the top few around myself. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, I can tell you the top guys in Cape Town, but there's not a, a rank. No. So I made a suggestion to the powers of that be that we get a rank and that it's not only for club and union racing but there must be an IRR rank as well. I mean, look at mm. the races last year. If if we had to say the best fanciers in one lot racing in winter, I felt it must be I mean you want Sapper and you want to yeah. In yeah. the summer yeah. Yuri won Yuri must be up there Cape Town and yeah. he won uh, yeah. he, he yeah. only won Carnival. So yeah. there must be a way statistical mathematical way to say on a, it's on, a, on a basis that's fair and equitable to yeah. everybody these are the best guys yeah but for me the ultimate is is if when we send 10 babies to a guy and he finds you after last year it was after nine weeks we got a call from a guy that had 10 babies from us and he had six winners already six out of ten so the, the, stats, the, the stats last year was there were about 70 babies raised countrywide and 41 was worse. Shh, okay. That's more than half. But I want to go back to something now that we brushed over, but I want to take yeah, you back there. Yes. Because that's my straight. I, I bought um, old Joe from Whitey. I bought the Tom Knox direct from Tom. Yes. And obviously I bought the Moray's direct from Arnie. Yes. And then you mentioned, you know, when there's a southeaster, we don't clock. Yeah. And, I, and I'd like to know why you It's simple. I mean, it's... The, the strain basically came to South Africa in 1938 with Patrick. Yeah. And he moved to the northern suburbs in 41 and then he demolished everything. And then Kippen went with his money and bought all the best ones. And, you know, pulled them together. And then he went to Europe and he spent absolute, I would say, millions yeah. in our... Current, current yeah, today. Yeah, for sure. He brought those birds and he, he only kept the two best ones, which was Slim and Slim. Slim and, yeah. and from that, I mean, all three names you, you mentioned now, mm -hmm. the, the origins can be traced back to that loft, to yeah. Kippen's loft. Yeah. That's where it all started. I mean, uh, uh, Ronan's Twilight, you know, yeah. all. If you look. Well, I think I got direct from Kippen's. From Kippen, yeah. yeah. So they've been in Gauteng or the Transvaal for the last 80 years, right? Okay. Just by natural selection, mm -hmm. because everybody had to have them to do well. Yes. Yeah. And what happens at the end of the season? The bad ones get lost or get killed. Mm -hmm. You only keep the good ones. So now over 80 years, if you look at the prevalent weather conditions during winter, on 80% of the weekends, the wind blows north percent And those are the performance. So what happens after 80 years of the strain? The ones that do well on the northwest ones are the ones you keep and you start getting rid of all the others. Yes. So when the term wind turns around, I can, the best example I have is, what year was it? 2001, I think. We raced on that day, we had a combined liberation with the GRPA. Yeah. The old GRPA. Yeah, yeah. On Bridgetown because of weather, they had to let the birds go together. Mm. And the wind was southeast. Southeast? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and my dad said, no one would see BC Cop you. You know, he was he was very competitive. And I said, today that you can't He said, Why? I said the wind is not it is yeah. not favorable for your strain of bird because he only had that. Yeah. But I had a, a, a little Janssen cock that we bred in and we found that where the wind's different. Yeah. yeah. And his daughter came and she demolished the whole of the combine. I think she beat the next bird by eight minutes. Yeah. And so what's your, your advice then on that? Because that's an interesting analogy that you've made. Yeah. I, I always say, you know, be, you, be versatile. You, you've got to have birds for every type of weather. Yeah. 
obviously the main body of your team mm -hmm. has to be in, in, in yeah, Hong Kong. Yeah, yeah. But in, and in the Cape, funnily enough, you know, they also get a lot of what I call left wing races when the yeah. South East is around. Yeah. But they also have right wing. And I can tell you now that the guys who race with our birds, I can tell them on a Monday, bask at these and these and these. And I say, no, what about that one? And I said, put her in, but she's not going to be your first bird. Yeah. Why? Interesting. When is on the right shoulder, when is on the left shoulder. And you can see very similar types of results in Belgium, where they also race from a southwest direction. Yes, yes. Sometimes when the east wind blows, only certain pigeons do well. Yes. And in different lots. Yeah. And then you can see, you know, it's it's worldwide. Uh, and interesting analogy. Yeah. 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 I'll take that. And for for anyone to become and be consistently in the top two or three of your union, you've got to be versatile. Because yeah. what happens now is you get two or three very fast races like last year. I think we had a 2,100 velocity yeah. and an 1,800 and a 1,900 on the longer distances. Yeah, we did. And to my Skada and Skanda, I was so focused on breeding one type of bird that for the first time, I think in three years, I didn't win the long distance sports. I didn't have those fast birds. Too fast here, yeah. So we had a three sisters where we plopped, that's, that's 800 cows, where we plopped just after two o'clock. I remember. Yeah. So I got 40th unit. Yeah. You know. So I'm way too fast. Yeah, way too fast. Mm. But my son, who we gave the sort of experimental stuff, mm. he was in the first 10 by inside. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, always, you've got, to be, you've got to be wide awake and you've got to plan for it. So yeah. what we, do is we keep birds that are good at that a little portion and we also don't train them the same so we'll keep them going just around the loft we won't fly them every week mm. but if i see on the 10 day forecast there's a possibility mm -hmm. of it then i give them a lacquer toss or they go on the sprint race mm. and i prepare them yeah. for for the fast race yeah. and, and i think guys must start learning that is that preparation oh, it's very important for a race. specialization you know i always yeah. use the analogy of golf pigeon racing and golf in terms of how difficult it is very yeah. similar and, and both as frustrating yes so it's easy to start both you know i can learn yeah. a set of clubs and that's a club and play and yeah. it's like it yeah you can sit with a friend and see, oh, these pigeons look like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like it. Let me get a little loft and yeah. keep a couple of birds, get a clock. Then you find out, that, that first race you don't make the sheet. Yeah. You know, and that's it's heartbreaking. Yeah. You say, now I've got to do a little bit better yeah. Yeah, and you start practicing and then it's not that hard to get into the first 10 yeah. of the club. You know, and maybe at the end of the season, the beginning and then seven or eight. Yeah. But to take the step up, to get into the first three of the club, yeah. now you've got to get serious pigeons. You've got to be doing the right things. And it just gets harder right. and harder. Yeah. Yeah. Then when you get to the top, yeah. you, you realize, you know, but just that to, to, hard. Yeah, to, <laughs> to become a scratch handicapper is yeah. difficult, but yeah. it's still way off beating Tiger Woods exactly. or Justin Thomas. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's a huge, huge challenge. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying is, We've got to find a way of bridging that gap. Yes, yeah, that's what and I'm saying. Because I think the guy's interested. Because a beginner comes in at the WRPA and he's racing against the opponent. Yes. It's not right. Well, it's, it's not, it's, not it's, right. It's, it's, it's not, not right. right. Because it's not fair. It's not fair. Yeah. And, and, and I'm the first one to say that's why I think we, we need to have a rethink in terms of how we structure the, board, the yeah. sport in South Africa. You know, it, we've got to have more winners. Yeah. And the guys at the top need to be willing to help either in terms of knowledge pigeons or money yeah i mean th this whole notion that the sport is going backwards is wrong and i'll tell you why i say that i agree with you by the way from the end of august last year until end of january i counted it myself there were on the internet and WhatsApp platforms more than 4,000 pigeons were sold. That is crazy. Yeah. At, at an average mm. of 3,500 per bird. Oof. That gives you 15 million rand. And then people say there's no money in this world. It's not true. Not true. There is. And we need to find a better way to channel that money. 
Yes. That's why I'm saying that I think the one by grace side of the, the sport mm. should be formalized. Mm. Same, but it must resort in the same way. Look, I, 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 with the masters, I approached him, but there was no, no comeback from him because I, what I proposed was that a, a one mark in South Africa <coughs> has to be same pro sanctioned. Exactly. Because otherwise I can, I can do what I want there. Exactly. And, and, but, but you, the, the but fact you is that it's professionalized. It's very yeah. Yeah. It does. And what happened, and as we spoke before we started mm -hmm. today, it's a very popular and strongly growing aspect of the sport yes, of exactly. racing. Every yeah. year they will. I yeah. mean, if you look in the States, just on their platform called Win Companion, mm -hmm. I counted 88 different yeah. online yeah, races. Yeah. 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 And across the globe, I mean, if if I had to take a thumb suck, I would say there's more than a thousand online races. In I don't think it'd be far. I think yeah. it'd be way under, actually. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. So, and, and, and it's very attractive for new guys coming into the sport yeah. because he doesn't have to it's have... It's much easier. Yes. He breeds healthy babies. So now them. if we say that's true, obviously we need those guys to help build the sport. So I think it's also on the one off race organisers to start going back a little bit. I think it's on the guys who do well. I, I, agree, I agree with you there. But also we need... The one, I'm talking about the one lock races that want to be international. I mean, we're completely blocked. Yeah. We're completely blocked. And unfortunately, and, and, we're and, sitting and, with a problem with the Department of Agriculture and yeah. Science that they they are, I think, overprotective of the poultry industry. Yeah. But they don't take into account that pigeons, to a very large extent, more than 99%, are not carriers of. Any avian Any of the doc was telling us that yesterday. Yes. Any so, avian so if you take the poultry, just quickly, we're getting off the subject now, but the poultry industry in the States yes. makes our poultry industry look, look like a. No. Like that. Yet they don't have any problems. Issues. Issues. Because, because they look at the science, and the science, science says yes. that there's the risk of pigeons bringing and carrying the disease. Nothing. It's negligible. Yeah. So yeah. what I'm saying is, is I'd like to have a chat to those people and explain to them. Well, they have to explain to me how does it happen that we get a many just, and, that's and that's it's because of migratory birds. And I asked the doc yesterday, is there any way that we can just set up some sort of committee so that we can have a chat because it's affecting the industry, it's affecting jobs, it's affecting, you know, there's a, there's a rundown that it, that it affects. Look, but I, I know how much effort the guys at Africa Pro has put in yeah. to try and solve this problem. Yeah. And they yeah, well, up against you the people. Closely, closely, you well, I helped them, you know, you with the concept. It, yeah. I didn't initiate it, but, you know, I was I think involved instrumental in yes. getting them on the right road. Yeah. Yeah. You know. But having said that, I think we shouldn't say that we can't get past that problem. I'm pretty no, sure I'm we've been the we next of year, coach, yeah. yes, and and the longer you inform people, yes, um, with and, and you can back it up with science, educate, I mean, yes, educate them. I think they will come around. Yeah, um, and I say that, that we we as a pigeon fraternity, we should make friends there. I can't agree. We should make more. friends, not there, enemies, and, and we should invite those people. Yeah, to come and have a look at how we do things. Yeah, because I was speaking to the doc about that same thing you're saying now. And um, we fall under static, and uh, you look at our neighbours, uh, Zimbabwe, I mean, they take 9,000 birds in and they've got no problem. Yes, exactly. They've got, in fact, they've got less problems with avian influenza than South Africa. Yeah. It's because pigeons can't carry it. Can't carry it, yeah. And that message needs to be conveyed, yeah. and we need to solve that problem. And I think we're on the way there. Yeah. You know, I, I just don't think it can be solved with friction. I think no, it's not all with negotiation. Yes. I think what, what happened in the past is that, you know, there were instances where shortcuts were taken and things... hundred percent. That's what the doc was saying. Yes. And, and I think, you know, we need to do things by the book, but we must make friends. Yeah. We need to get them on our side. Yeah. They need to understand that the pigeon industry in South Africa is great. I mean, yeah. it's, it, it's probably, if I have to take a, 
a, a wild stag. It's somewhere around a billion rand a year in yeah. Australia, yeah. in South Africa. And it's growing. And it's growing. So, yeah, we need the leaders in the sport must take this and go. Yeah. And so we call it on you, Mr. Pain. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one thing I, you know, I've been approached many, many times to get involved in that exploration. Um, but it's, it's so time consuming. And, and, the, yes, yeah. and there's very little benefit. And that's why I say once the administration gets professional, professional. then you can start hiring the best guys for the job. Yeah. Um, the only thing with that, uh, Steve, we, 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 and typically we, they're not pigeon fancies, you know. 100%. But the way that would have to go, because um, um, in other sports, you know, so like I've been involved in boxing mm -hmm. and I follow the rugby and I follow the football. All those administrators are all paid through the government exactly. and sponsors. Correct. So our vision sport being amateur, so-called amateur, yes. with the amount of money coming in, it's far from amateur, we're not getting a grant from the government. Yes. So we can't appoint uh, uh, an MD. Although we have to, to adhere to SASCOC, yes. we're not getting the the funding I, I think you, I, I fully agree with you. I think Sandpo's is underfunded. Yes. Whether we're going to get government grants, I think Sandpo's done a fantastic job in doing the study last year with uh, the lady from uh, the University of Stellenbosch. I've forgotten that now. Um, where the sport was under serious threat, though, mm -hmm. um, to, in terms of the Invasive Species Act, etc., etc., et yes, and, yeah. and they've successfully battled that. Okay. I mean, there's still, as we speak today, I think, serious issues with some of the municipal, municipality acts that preclude people from holding more than two or three birds yes. on the nest. And, and I think St. Paul is doing, uh, and luckily we blessed with, you know, some fantastic um, Legal guys that yes. find business. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think Sam do a lot of work that we don't know about. That, that, yeah, see, I think beyond the scenes. Which you know, we'll try I, and I always, you know, I always say, you know, to to it's easy to criticise. Oh, it's easy to criticise. But if you identify a problem, please come with a solution as well. Yeah. You know, I had Robin Rona on not too long ago. Right. And when you hear the things that they're doing and beyond the scenes and the it's, work, yeah. you're like. Yeah, you know, we just need to be. I'm fun. not up for that. I, no, know, I'm not up for that. With Rona and, and, and Robert doing, I'm not up for it. But they, we need to know what they are doing yes. so that they can be appreciated. Yes. Because communication, I communication think, is a huge, yeah. huge issue at the moment. Yeah. I think if I've had many discussions with Ivan Pretorius and some other guys at Sandpo, just to get direct communication from the Sandpo executive down to the prospects. Now, the, the restructure that it includes the provinces, I think, was a good idea, mm -hmm. but I don't know, I don't see the benefits. You know, it's it's created another level of communication, and a lot gets lost. You know, from tier to tier. Yeah, it's from the executive to the provinces, from the provinces down mm -hmm. to the unions, mm -hmm. and then from the unions to the clubs to the to the fancy. Doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, we've got technology, we've got email, we've got WhatsApp. What's yeah. Please, let's use it. You know, and websites. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of that is lacking at the moment. Yeah. I think they are working on that. From what I gathered, I think they are. So I like, you know, noticed that it was a communication very important. And I think. So I think we're forward to that. that it's going to go forward. Yeah. You know, I think uh, we need to start thinking strategically where the sport's going. Yeah. Uh, need to protect it. I think South Africa is in a very unique position where I think we do have the best birds in the world. Honestly. You know, I think Well we've been fortunate to have had a lot a lot of imports coming with all the That's the thing, you know, and <coughs> best, I think our nature yeah. of of competitiveness yeah. has taken those pigeons and yeah. Yeah. No, I agree so, with you. no so Steer, thank you very much for coming in. Yeah, We're gonna do this again. No, I think if I make a suggestion, you know, Please let's do. get a uh, set of topics maybe from the Facebook guys. Yes. Let them send topics in and let's yeah, get a we'll panel discussion. Yeah, I will definitely okay. do that. Okay. Thank you very much, man. Pleasure. Okay. All right.